Welcome to this webinar organized by the Information and Data Management Community of Practice of the CGR platform for Big Data and Agriculture. I'm Celine Eboe, Communication Coordinator of the COP, and I will facilitate the webinar. Today, we'll learn about Open Safely. This is a topic of interest for users of sensitive data as Open Safely allows to analyze data without compromising the anonymity of human subjects. And to know more about it, we'll start by watching an introductory video of Ben Goldacre joint principal investigator of Open Safely. Then we'll have three speakers live with us. Zhao Ku will host a fireside chat with John Massey, and then Pythagoras will demo how they have adapted the Open Safely approach to agriculture. So now I will ask support from Pythagoras, who has an excellent internet connection, to broadcast the video of Ben Godacre explaining what is Open Safely. And please keep in mind that this is an edited video. I'd like to talk about opensafely.org. Um, this is something we constructed during the COVID-19 pandemic and working on behalf of NHS England, we've now built a full open source, highly secure analytics platform running across the full pseudonymized primary care records of 55 million patients. First of all, to preserve patients' privacy, we don't let users download data onto their own machine. We don't even give them naked access to that data in a remote desktop. Instead, we've built the analytics platform inside the electronic health record system vendors data centers where the data already resides. We also have written bespoke software for the whole data management pipeline. And by imposing light touch standards on that, three important things follow. Firstly, it means our variables are readily reusable and understandable to everybody else. Secondly, it means that we can share readable and intelligible logs about everything that's happened on the data. And lastly, and most importantly, it means that we can generate dummy data, synthetic data that reflects the real data well enough for code development to be done in the open, but we don't use that dummy data to execute the code. Instead, you develop code in the open against the synthetic data, and then that code is sent through to execute against the real data in the closed environment. Now, because we work inside the EHR vendor data center, data flows with unprecedented speed. All code and all code lists are shared by default and indeed must be shared openly under open licenses for reuse. That's the only way that you can execute code on open safely, and that's to address some of the shortcomings that we've seen in the health data research landscape where code and code lists are not shared and indeed sometimes are actively withheld. Pandemics call for bigger, faster data. A global health emergency requires that you have access to an enormous volume of data and in near real time. So you need very large data and you need fast flowing data. But the challenge then becomes privacy. And it's important to understand the privacy problems we're able to or aiming to overcome, principally the challenge of re-identification. So the common means for ensuring that people cannot be identified when their health records are shared is called pseudonymization. Specific and very disclosive pieces of information like your name, the calendar date of your birth, the last digits of your postcode, are removed from the record. Now, superficially that's appealing, but the challenge is that unfortunately, records that have been pseudonymized in that way are still very vulnerable to re-identification. Now, to be clear, researchers are trustworthy and they're carefully evaluated to be trustworthy, but to understand privacy and security risks, researchers talk about threat modeling and work through worst case scenarios. So with that in mind, here's an example of how you might think through the vulnerabilities of pseudonymization. It would be very straightforward to identify Tony Blair, knowing probably only the year of his birth and the weeks in which, as a matter of public record, he had his abnormal heart rhythm treated at a hospital in London. Now, importantly, the risk of re-identification from this approach increases as your data set grows to cover a larger proportion of the total population. So let's say you've got a 10% sample of the population and with three characteristics you know about somebody you're trying to re-identify them, trying to re-identify, you do find one unique person who matches those three characteristics. Well, assuming no additional knowledge, all other things being equal, you can only be 10% certain that you've identified your target because there might be another nine matches in the remaining 90% of the population. But if you have data on 100% of the population and you find one unique match for the characteristics you know, then you can be certain you've found the target of interest. Now, sometimes people are quite dismissive about this as a problem, and I think that's risky for a number of different reasons. First of all, um, in order to justify access to data, we need to make uh, a clear demonstration that we are taking all reasonable, practical, currently available steps 
to um, manage the privacy risks. And if we can manage privacy, which Open Safety demonstrates that we can, then in my view, we certainly should. Secondly, this is not a theoretical risk. So you'll often find in local newspapers examples of individuals who perhaps working on the front desk of a GP surgery have um, stalked their ex-girlfriends or girls they went to school with or their ex-partner to find out where she's now living with their children using the medical records. So we know that it happens with medical records. So we wanted to have access to huge data sets. We wanted to do it in a really private way. Third bit of background before we get to our design choices. You want all code and code lists for all analyses shared for a number of reasons. Number one, reproducibility. So narrative descriptions of the methods used to manage and analyze data are generally ambiguous and isn't sufficient to help others understand or replicate the work. Where you can see the code that people are running, then you can see uh, what the reasons are for divergence. So reproducibility. Second, um, you improve quality through review. All research will have shortcomings. Reciprocal review can improve quality, identify errors. Problems might arise in data analysis code or data management code. Thirdly, efficient reuse. So it takes a huge amount of work to generate data management and analysis code. And when that work's been done once, it's useful if that work is available for review and then considered reuse by others running an identical or similar task. That's the norm throughout the open source software community and in many other areas of scientific research, physics, genomics and so on. It facilitates efficient innovation rather than repetition of low value tasks and it happens much more readily if the original code is um, at least annotated or somewhat standardised as we'll come to in a moment with open safely. Uh, then smaller print but nonetheless important capacity building. When new analysts uh, and new researchers and developers come into my team, they benefit from libraries of code which show the tasks that they're learning being practically implemented by others before them and in a reasonably readable and well documented format, for example, in a Jupyter notebook. Lastly, trust and accountability. So different stakeholders, it is fair to say, have varying levels of trust in the ability of government and, in the, and the NHS to make best use of their data and to protect their privacy. And sharing code openly provides an additional oversight mechanism. It encourages analysts to write higher quality code, discourages inappropriate use of data. And obviously the public mostly will not review code, knowing that it's in public and can be audited and provides some reassurance. So those in headline form were the issues that we were aiming to address. Lastly, we wanted people to share code, but not in a messy way. Now, typically when people process one row per clinical event data into a nice one row per patient data set, they do it in a kind of jumble of a bit of SQL, a bit of R, a bit of Python, a bit of Stata. And the problem with that is none of it is shared in any kind of um, reusable or reproducible way. It's all very, very um, operator specific and project specific. So we wanted to create a kind of generalizable framework. So. Here were our objectives overall. Number one, massive open source um, data analysis platform. More data than ever before so that we could address COVID needs. Higher security than current offers in order to justify that higher volume of data. No huge data downloads like CPRD and others offer. No needless access to view the raw data as in many off the shelf trusted research environments but researchers still able to run the analyses conveniently across the most um, disclosive raw data. We wanted all code for data management analysis to be shared to support open science, critical review and reuse so we can get more and better use of health data, but we also wanted it to be shared in a way that facilitates reuse. We wanted that data curation and data management therefore to be done in a pragmatically standardised framework that we were going to have to create. And um, more than anything else, we needed to do all this in a way that was completely transparent to the public and others about all actions on the data. Last up, we needed to reflect the low startup cost because you can get money to do single studies of your own, but you can't get money to create infrastructure in health data research or to help other people. We needed it to be completely modular. Let me tell you what we built. Number one, as I said, we built the analytics platform inside the existing data set, inside the data centers of the electronic health record software providers where the data already resides. Now that brings a number of key advantages. 
it means that trusted analysts can run analyses across data in near real time instead of waiting for intermittent data extracts. It also means that you get, uh, you're already operating in a highly secure environment, compliant with standards like ISO 27001 um, from the moment you start. It means you can keep logs of every action on the data. Number two, going beyond a trusted research environment. So I mentioned in brief that we've built a bespoke data management pipeline which is um, somewhat standardized. Now to explain what I mean by that, let me see if I can give you some examples of what the underlying data looks like. So uh, this is what uh, raw electronic health records data looks like. So typically you have one row per clinical event and you'll have NHS number, you'll have the patient's name, you'll have some kind of event code and then it'll have a date and a time and it'll have a location. What you want to produce is something much more like this. One row per patient, and then a binary variable. You want to know, have they got a history of asthma? And you'll create that with rules. You'll look for either asthma diagnosis codes or asthma treatment codes or investigations that mean that somebody's got a condition and you will turn all of those into a binary variable. You might want um, a numeric variable like BMI and you want an outcome like, have they died from COVID? Now you want to produce all of these from the underlying records. And to do that, you're going to get uh, some code lists and you want to match those code lists against the underlying record here. So on Open Safely, anybody can use this. You can use this, by the way, to build ICD code lists. If you're interested, you can go along to codelist.opensafely.org and sign up. If you click on the COPD one here, you can see some summary information about it at the beginning. And then underneath, you can see the full list of individual codes that you would look for in a given date range. And then underneath that, if you're really interested, you can see the tree in the complex poly hierarchy of uh, whatever data dictionary you've built your code list in. Now, you will take that code list and you will apply it using a blob of code. When you know that your data management code and your data analysis code is capable of running to completion, it gets parceled up and push through into the live environment, which you never have access to. It produces your results tables, your graphs or your logs if your model has failed to converge infuriatingly, and then it dumps them in an outputs folder and you go along and you look at your outputs folder. And when you are confident that it contains nothing disclosive, then you press a button and the results of your study get pushed back out to GitHub to the repo from which it came. And that in outline is how Open Safety works. Thank you, Ben, for this introduction and thank you for Peter Grass for the broadcast. So let me share you a link. This clip was made from a one hour webinar on Open Safely. You will find the link in the chat if you wish to watch the full record. Now that we know what Open Safely is, let's dive deeper into the topic with a fireside chat with John Massey and Zhao Ku. John Massey is a data scientist at the University of Oxford, focusing on Open Safely research platform with over a decade of experience of commercial and research data engineering. Zhao Ku is a senior research fellow at IFPRI. He has more than 20 years of experience in multidisciplinary geospatial data set and integrated modeling analysis. He co-pioneered the platform for data and agriculture and coordinates the CDR Consortium for Spatial Information. John gratefully agreed to join us and chat with Jao to discuss what Open Safely means for agricultural research and development practitioners and how this might be used to unlock sensitive agricultural data. Jao, John, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Erlene. Um, so welcome, everyone. I think this is really exciting moment. We've been hearing uh, internally within Big Data Platform, also within, uh, within our community of practice, we've been hearing about it. Uh, Open Safely has been discussed in a couple of times, but we never really had a chance to interact with somebody in the Open Safely group. So it, it's a great opportunity to learn more about it or to hear from uh, somebody already in, in the group developing this uh, from the behind the scene and everything uh, operationalized. 
So yeah, welcome, John, and, and thanks again for your time and uh, joining with us. Uh, it's it's my pleasure, Tara. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so just a quick recap. Uh, the band presentation uh, gave us really good ideas and good overview of how it came about and how it's being used and how carefully each kind of architecture to protect the privacy of patient data, highly sensitive information, but while still uh, accelerating science. So uh, John, uh, can you give us a little bit of idea that this is all happened because of COVID-19 or was it already kind of being underdeveloped and just accelerated through COVID-19 because of the necessity? Certainly the, the global pandemic did accelerate the, uh, the, the design and implementation of Open Safely. Um, the, the data lab, the group at Oxford University, who's developed Open Safely, has a, has a history of other open source and open access health analytics platforms. So openprescribing.net was a very well received one that's still running today. Um, so these ideas of, uh, of open source reproducible science and ensuring patients' uh, privacy and safety of the data were, were fomenting within the group and then the opportunity to, to drive that forward. Um, as has been mentioned, there are existing trusted research environments for primary care and, and some, some hospital clinical data in the UK, but they have many of the shortcomings that was, we've just heard about. Um, but without a, a, a strong impetus to, uh, to move forward, they were, they were seen as adequate for the research needs at the time. Um, but yeah, things changed. Yeah, and uh, you also had uh, some experience in animal science, and livestock science. Yeah, so so my, my PhD prior to working with the University of Oxford was building a, a research data bank for One Health antimicrobial resistance based at the University of Bristol. So that's taking lots of sensitive livestock data, some human data, environmental data, and uh, encountered many of the same many of the same challenges. Yeah. Have you tried? Um, any different platform? Was there any other attempt to do something like this before Open Safely uh, came online? Uh, was there any other ways that people get around this issue? Yeah, so I mean, certainly in the UK, there's there's a fantastic project called the um, UK Secure E Research Platform, which hosts many trusted research environments. Um, that is more of the model where data is sent to a secure data warehouse and with appropriate checks and balances on researcher access, researchers can, can, can interrogate the data directly within that trusted research environment. In my own experience of trying to acquire sensitive agricultural data from commercial sources, that was, that was unacceptable to many of those commercial partners, which is where I think the, the open safely approach of bringing the analytical platform to where the data already resides, rather than moving data around the place, is, is, is an absolutely fantastic idea. I think that's, that's, that's a brilliant way of going about it. Right, also Ben mentioned a few times that really key um, kind of uh, foundational principle was to run open safely within the secure data environment already uh, in place, uh, which is not always the case in agriculture. Um, I must say, if we go to uh, some country uh, where Minister of Agriculture or Minister of Livestock uh, manages the data at the district level, uh, they might not have all the secure st international standard compliant level of security in place. So do, do, do you have some suggestions on how uh, that kind of uh, environment can really uh, leapfrog into this secured environment? It it's about designing a, a solution that's appropriate for the domain. Mm -hmm. And the domain that we operate in is the companies, the, 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 the data owners, the people who've collected this data are all operating in an extremely highly regulated environment because they're, they're holding extremely private data, you know, because most private data about their medical records. Where your data providers are not of that standard, then it may be more appropriate to find a means of transporting that data securely to a existing trusted research environment. So things like UK SERP or the kind of UK biobank ones, you know, the, the, there's, there's quite a lot of existing literature, both industry and academic literature about building these trusted research environments. So it's, um, it's, it's about you know, choosing an approach or maybe a hybrid approach. Now you might have, mm -hmm. have some data partners where they, they're unwilling to transport the data outside of their environment, 
and you may have other ones which are more willing and, and would, would prefer you to do it that way. So I'm sure there are there are hybrid approaches uh, possible. Yeah. So if, from the analytic group, group uh, that you, you are part of, yeah, again, like we are addressing it, uh, we are approaching it as an agriculture um, kind of solution, uh, addressing agricultural issues. Like for example, uh, during during the one CGIR, uh, the uh, the transition process. So we are developing initiatives, uh, one CGIR initiative that are uh, cut across many domains of, of our research across CGIR. And yeah, I've been also interacting with some of them, like for example, animal health scientists dealing with livestock health record data, uh, which is also quite sensitive because of the medicine and disease and efficacy of different treatment kind of information. Uh, these are all very sensitive data. Uh, plant health scientists that I, I didn't know before are also dealing with quite sensitive like phytosensory data, uh, which sometimes could be um, coming with very uh, important food security issues and trade implications. And of course, household survey data, it also has very much a uh, micro level uh, data, very highly granular data comes with the uh, re-identification risk and things like that. So uh, there are a lot of kind of opportunities, I think, um, that we can also learn from open safety experience and adapt into our kind of uh, use cases. Uh, so- I was just uh, gonna say, Joe, I mean, certainly yes. I think uh, in my experience, the, the yes. re-identification risk within um, agricultural data sets has either been poorly understood or, or underestimated by, mm -hmm by many, many people um, up until this point. So, for example, I was mainly dealing with um, treatment records from dairy farms in the Southwest of the UK. Mm. And you know, if I could say, well, you know, this farm houses 250 cows and they are robotically milked and they're crossbreed Holston Frisian jerseys and they're in this region of the country with those four pieces of information, there is only one farm that, that meets those criteria. So I, I haven't given away the, direct identifiers, but it is, it is a trivial task to re-identify them. And it's something I think if you can't get anybody to take away a single message from all of this is that the re-identification is incredibly important and an incredibly high risk uh, field. Right. Um, so there, there is seem to be always kind of balance uh, we, we should be able to strike. Uh, so the, that the privacy concern and security regulatory issues are really important. We, we need to get it right from the beginning. That's totally, um, it, we are totally in agreement. At the same time, uh, we don't want to wait so much uh, until we develop completely perfect solution when we are starting from very really baby steps uh, when our, again, the, our local partners may not have this level of infrastructure and regulatory framework. So um, is, is there something that we can quickly adapt from open safely and use it in agricultural domain? Uh, so yeah, I wasn't. Uh, so we, we are kind of trying to understand how uh, what would be the, our practical next step uh, to take it forward from here yeah. in agriculture. I mean, all of the code is open source. It's all MIT licensed. Um, yep. All of our design documents are open source. All of our thought processes. So you know, we, we are very much in the spirit of, of reproducible science and open science. Um, I, I don't think it's probably something you could completely take off the shelf and, and just spin up and, and get going with, but certainly the um, yeah the, the designs and methods are all, all fully open source. Um, I think the approach of allowing researchers' analytical code to be run without giving researchers direct access to the data is a significant innovation in reducing your attack surface. Um, it has previously been the case where researchers request exports and they'd be sent exports. And once you've sent them out, you've lost all control of it. Similarly, once you allow people to connect to a database and see the raw data, you've, you've lost a significant amount of control. So um, replicating that model, I think, is a, 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 a good, good starting point. Great, yeah, and, and already all the principles a band went through uh, presented today. I think that that gave us really good roadmap of where and how quickly we can adapt into our one, one challenge you might find in the agricultural domain, and uh, something that struck me when I moved from working in agriculture to working in primary care is you saw their open code list.org. So we have these reference lists of clinical events, observations, treatments that have, have unique identifier codes. Um, that seems to be less uh, 
less commonplace in a lot of uh, certainly animal health uh, data. So you're, you're much more reliant on free text analyses, which um, are more error prone, sometimes hard to reproduce. Um, I, I spent four and a half years on a PhD trying to solve that. I don't think I can uh, give you an overnight <laughs> solution to that. <laughs> No, yeah, no, I did. That's an excellent point. Yeah, we, we still don't have universal like field ID or universal animal ID. Yeah, no, those are really fundamental, fundamental data element that uh, we are still uh, lacking. And that, yeah, we, we hope that that will be uh, resolved pretty soon. Yeah, we have been also hearing from international organizations like GS1 on uh, trying to develop some kind of standard uh, with a lot of uh, different kind of disciplines of communities yeah. together. So yeah, okay. I mean before yes you, you, you could wait forever for various bodies to come up with these standardized approaches yeah. in the meantime you can massively multiply the um you can reduce the amount of research and developer effort by doing all these things in the open mm -hmm. the number of times you know a particular kind of search approach or algorithm or, or, or keyword list for identifying a cluster of diseases from free text has been replicated by researchers in several different institutions, each in slightly different ways. Now, if they'd all shared all of their code and all of their reference lists in an open source manner, by their combined efforts, they might have not had to spend quite as much time and could have got a higher quality, more reproducible results. So uh, it's, that's another you know, call for doing things in, in as open source way as possible, whenever possible. Absolutely. No, I, I think that that's also very good lessons learned. Yeah, the, throughout the open uh, open safely development process under COVID nineteen, imagine we everything got stuck <laughs> because we didn't have a standard or something. So yeah, that, that's absolutely true. Um, we don't necessarily want to wait until somebody figure out this standard way. So yeah, doing it openly in a uh, scientific kind of community that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So th thanks a lot for sharing your experience. Have you seen any of this kind of adaptation? into agricultural domain or even other disciplines open safely uh, being already in operation well, well not not the open safely platform itself um, we are uh, at the moment we are prototyping other uk healthcare based backends to, to feed into open safely but um, this this model of not allowing direct research or access to the data, but instead parceling up the code and shipping it into a secure environment. To my, to my knowledge, I've not known this in any other, uh, any other domains, no. <laughs> okay, so I think that's a nice segue into our next portion of the webinar. Um, so um, our, our colleague, Pythagoras. Pythagoras Karen Piperis is the CEO of SIO. He's an expert on big data analytics, semantic web technology, machine learning, data mining, and artificial intelligence and has been involved in the conception, coordination, and realization of more than 35 international and national projects, including the design and development of Guardian. Over to you, Pythagoras, to demo uh, what you have uh, done with uh, an approach for open safely for agriculture. Okay, uh, so before the demo, I would like to give some observations on the aspects and issues that we need to consider for applying the open safely concept on data of the agricultural domain. Uh, we should certainly start uh, from examining some uh, distinct characteristics of this data. First, we need to highlight that uh, data are in general highly heterogeneous using different structures. In some cases, the structure is actually defined within the data, for example, with a separate metadata set in tabular data files. Moreover, while different data sets may refer to the same variables, they are not immediately comparable and thus suitable for being combined uh, as they are produced with different experimental settings, are of different resolution and granularity and so on. Lastly, it is important that the same data sets can be used for uh, hugely different uh, analysis, depending on the discipline, aim of the analysis, uh, etc. Uh, furthermore, we think that in the case of agricultural data, it is necessary for the users to have a prior view of some form of the data, so as to be able to build uh, their analytical scripts. To serve this need, uh, we must consider different approaches uh, for exposing enough uh, information 
uh, so as to allow the creation of uh, the scripts without compromising data safely. Uh, some of these uh, uh, the, uh, methods have been mentioned in, in uh, the video that we saw in the beginning of this webinar. Uh, the first one uh, is the exposure of sample partial data, which of course are re representing exactly the full database, but is a process that would probably require a development uh, of a full-fledged sampling uh, service to ensure that samples are adequate. Another approach is the exposure of uh, obfuscated data, a process that will respect sensitivity and privacy by definition. However, obfuscation uh, should be carefully designed in order to preserve enough information for the analytical scripts to be designed and assessed. And the third uh, option is the exposure of synthetic data, a method that fully protects the real data. But on the other side, uh, this is also a multi-factor difficult task as we need to ensure that synthetic data carry the same uh, characteristics, the same statistical properties with the real ones, and possibly for different uh, use cases. Additionally, uh, some other aspects that we need to take into account uh, have to do with the establishing on a, of an efficient mechanism for script auditing that will ensure that the system is not misused or abused. For example, a script could be used to mine the real data and download them in, in another location. Uh, and with the possibility that we would need to foresee the adoption of different data preparation approaches for different use cases. And that is, in some cases, that obfuscation could be preferable to sampling and vice versa. In other cases, we may need to produce synthetic data. To move on uh, uh, to the demo, uh, I will showcase via uh, a simple example how script development would work for a uh, different domain data under the open safely paradigm. The demo includes two cases. One for developing a script using sample data from a time series and another one using geospatial data of lower resolution before moving to the real uh, high resolution data set. This is a uh, uh, work that we do within the context of the big data platform of uh, the CGAR, and it is highly uh, related with CG Labs, a data analytics platform that we have uh, built, which is open source and it's cloud native. Uh, and this part uh, is uh, uh, based on a technology that is called uh, uh, Jupyter Gateway that allows us to send uh, uh, the Jupyter kernels close to the data. Uh, so the, all the different scripts run inside the space where the data are located rather than the opposite, sending the data to, the, to, the, to your notebook, to your uh, uh, scripting kernel. So I will open uh, uh, Jupyter. And what I will do is I will ask the system to, uh, to create two kernels, one, that will be sent to the uh, to the public space, and another one that will be sent to the private space. For the sake of uh, understanding, I will I will split my uh, <coughs> screen in half. So here is the public data space, and here is the private one. The idea is that in the public data space uh, we have data. We have two data sets. One is a time series data set uh, that we have only uh, data for uh, 10 years from 2000 until 2010. And uh, we have uh, another data set, which is a map that has been obfuscated uh, using uh, a resolution that is uh, about 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers. So here uh, I will run a, a very simple script. Uh, this script just uh, and what it does is, is just uh, visualizes uh, the known data that we have in the public space. So I will run this script. And what we will see here is uh, uh, the uh, public time series. Uh, so I can see the data that have been made public uh, from 2000 until 2010. And the second data set is uh, a map that has been obfuscated. Uh, uh, using a resolution of 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers. So uh, uh, with the hat of a scientist, what 
I can do is uh, I can uh, I can check on the public space, on the space that everybody has access to check the structure, to check what these data are about, uh, and design accordingly a script that uh, when it will be run in the safe space, in the private space, uh, it will produce uh, the real analytics. Uh, but I don't have to worry about the, the my script in the sense that the structure will be the same as long as the exposed data in the public space, either synthetic or sampled or uh, via uh, <coughs> uh, anonymization, follow the same uh, structure, the same uh, yeah, the same structure. So what I will uh, do again is I will run exactly the same uh, script uh, in the private data space. And what I'm expecting to, uh, to get is uh, analytics that the same analytics that uh, will run over the entire row uh, data that is uh, inside the private space. The data have never traveled to me, either to my kernel uh, or to my machine. Uh, it is rather the opposite. The computing kernel, the script that I just uh, wrote, traveled to these data spaces and was executed there. What I see here is the result of uh, my script. So here I see uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the entire uh, time series that goes up to 2020. Uh, and in the lower part, I can see uh, the data that are of uh, uh, in, the, in, the real, uh, in the real resolution rather than the obfuscated ones. And obviously, this can be, uh, uh, you can use your imagination uh, on the heterogeneity of the data that you can have in, uh, in our domain and the, the, and the scripting that you can do uh, over this data. Uh, to follow uh, up uh, what Javu uh, was discussing before uh, with John, it is important to understand that by just having the infrastructure and the technical tools that can ship the computing to the data or to have in a public data space uh, anonymized or, or obfuscated data, it's not enough in the sense that we need uh, to, to know, someone needs to check that these scripts, the scripts that eventually will run in this, uh, in this space, do not expose something that should be uh, protected. But this is uh, what we have achieved so far using uh, the, uh, uh, the Jupyter Gateway technology uh, in uh, the uh, CG Labs uh, uh, computing environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter Gross, for, for this uh, demo. Mela, would you like to tell us a bit more how CGR will continue on, on that and will continue to work on this kind of open safety approach for uh, agriculture? Sure. Um, thanks very much for that. Very interesting uh, for, from all of the speakers. Uh, thanks very much for, for coming together and giving us this, this overview. It's fantastic. And I think it does hold a lot of promise for CGIR, obviously. I think that should be obvious to everyone listening. Uh, we are at the, at the heart of it um, all about open science. We need to be about open science because the kinds of challenges that we face uh, require that we action over a lot of data. Um, the, the, uh, and of course, there are you know, uh, mitigating factors to that. On the other side of the equation, you heard some of the risks uh, uh, already from the video, just to reiterate, you know, the risk of re-identification, um, uh, the, 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 the reluctance of, of some of the, you know, the owners and the subjects, both of, of the data, uh, uh, sort of trusting a particular entity, whether it be a government entity or other entity, uh, to, to sort of manage and hold that data singularly uh, safely is, is another issue. Um, for us, from, from in the agriculture domain, I think we're dealing a lot with reproducibility and the need to, to have that reproducibility. So that, again, argues for the open science. Um, um, uh, I, I, and the other other side of it is is you know uh, having to download large amounts of data in order to action over this. Um, often we're not able to do this um, in in the geographies that we work in, particularly. Um, 
so so there are you know while we're striving for open science where we're, we're trying striving for reusing as much data as possible there are all of these other risks and and constraining factors that we have to deal with um with 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 this ability to to um to action you know to bring our scripts to the data we we get past that obviously and and uh, are much more able to resolve that issue uh that tension essentially between you know, uh, uh, making our, our data open and, and managing the risks of, of, of being able to open the action over the data. Um, so obviously this has, you know, I'm reiterating, I'm trying to pull together everything you've probably heard and, and processed already, but just trying to pull it together um, and, and form the case for it. Now, in terms of how we go ahead with this, I mean, what Pythagoras showed you um, was extremely promising. It's a very good move in the right direction. Uh, we already have CG labs in place. We already have some of the preliminary groundwork that Pythagoras and his team have done. Um, the question is, how do we actually uh, uh, test and and uh, you know uh, govern this? How do we um, operationalize it in a, in a way that uh, uh, meets the needs across all of our initiatives? Because socioeconomic data, this kind of of um, risk prone, if you will, uh, uh, PII containing data uh, is, is exists across all of our three, they're not called pillars anymore. I, I believe they're called action areas, you know, the systems transformation action area, the, the um, regional agri-food systems trans, uh, 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 action area, as well as the genetic innovations action area. This is a common problem across these different pillars. Um, so, so a solution that uh, of this sort probably likely has applications across, you know, across all of our um, new initiative portfolio. Um, so in going forward with it, I think there needs to be much more user testing that we need to figure out where it's housed, how it's housed, how it's implemented, uh, what is the governance uh, uh, behind it and how, how do we operationalize this? And I think with the transition still sort of <laughs> chunking its way through, um, you know, there, there may be several questions that we still need to answer, but I, I believe that there is tremendous promise in this um, and it will allow us to move ahead on our um, open science, open data uh, uh, goals in, in a much more effective way without compromising uh, uh, the privacy of, the, of our human subjects, without compromising uh, the institution uh, in terms of exposing it to greater risk. Um, and there are many positives to it. So I'm, I'm very, very excited by what I see, uh, but I don't have any concrete um, answers to how we go ahead. I can only sort of pose it uh, what the next steps need to be in terms of the user testing, in terms of the governance um, and, and finding a home for, for all of this stuff at a, at a higher level. So Jawu, I don't know if that, um, and Celine, I don't know if that sort of answers the question, but um, that's that's where we are. And maybe others in the audience have some ideas as well. So it'd be interesting to hear from the audience at this stage. Yeah, thanks, Meda. That's a great transition. So we are indeed now at our question and comment sessions. Uh, John, can you tell us a bit more about the synthetic data? If it is a robust, if it is robust enough, could you could there be cases where analysis on synthetic data might be good enough, especially where the risk of re-identification is very high and real? I, not entirely sure I understand the question. Um, so the, the, the processes are open safely we have in place to ensure the, the privacy around analysis of statistical data are in the design of the system that we've heard lots about already but also thorough human-based review of any analytical code by experts and subsequently um, secondary review of any outputs by trained uh, data disclosivity output checkers. Um, so I think, yeah, there's an important point there. It's, it's not just all about the technology. There are, there are human factors and there are process factors in the play. Thank you. Mira, you have raised your hand. I, I don't know if it's a question or a comment, but you know, one thing that um, we deal with a lot in agriculture, you know, we, we talk about engaging uh, private sector a lot. Um, and we often, there's nobody here from private sector, is there? <laughs> well, I mean, there's always, there's always a concern that, that uh, private sector, you know, gets more out of the relationship sometimes than than we do in terms of the data, uh, you know, being able to uh, to make use of valuable data that that some of the agri-food um, 
companies might might be privy to. And I wonder, maybe this is a question for you after all, John. I mean, I, I, you mentioned uh, engaging with private sector, and I'm wondering if this could be our kind of conduit to um, reassuring our, our private sector partners and friends that, you know, in fact, what they're holding for data is really, really valuable to advance um, this, the state of the research more broadly speaking, uh, while not compromising their sort of, you know, their, their uh, business um, model uh, it, that, that's built on uh, different aspects of that data. So they don't, we don't own the data, we don't take it anywhere, but we still benefit from it. Have you um, concrete examples like that, say with pharma or, or other uh, players in-, in Yeah, so the, the commercial partners from, from our PhD were, the standard question was what's in it for us? You know, there, there's a risk, there's a risk to our business, even you know, with, with all of the assurances and ISO 27001 certification, there is still a, a risk to our business by making this data available. What's in it for us? And what we found is we have the expertise around reporting and benchmarking usage of antimicrobials in livestock that their customers were asking for, or they had to meet a regulatory requirement to report those uh, and were, were struggling to do that uh, internally. So that that was, that was the key, was finding something that was mutually beneficial. It was beneficial to us to have access to a broad range of antimicrobial usage data, and it was beneficial to them to have the domain experts um, uh, analysing, reporting that data back to their customer base. Thank you, John. Thank you, Meda. So, Brian, you have a, a question for Pythagoras. Hi there. Thanks very much. Um, I'm interested in in the a bit a bit about the um, you know, we've we've got a lot of inspiration from Open Safely, and Open Safely has uh, you know put out its code and and been open and collaborative throughout. I'm wondering how transferable the actual code um, was from from Open Safely, or if we had to, or if Pythagoras and company had to sort of build from the ground up. Uh, I uh, already answered in the chat, so as to be oh, also there it is. in the history, but I will. Uh, I will explain. Uh, what we did uh, was we didn't start. Uh, uh, we didn't use uh, Open Safely code. The issue is that it is uh, very uh, clinical record specific. Uh, so uh, instead, uh, we prefer to start with a, a more generic technology uh, that also fits. Uh, well, uh, CG Labs. CG Labs is uh, based on Jupyter. So we started uh, with a Jupyter Enterprise Gateway, which is an open source technology originally developed by IBM, and it's domain agnostic. And we, st we started to build uh, using uh, the technology. However, we have taken, uh, I think that we have taken several lessons from Open Safely. So uh, to give the right credits, uh, it was not. It is not only the concept, but also by reading their documentation, we understood potential threats and issues that we need to take care of. Uh, which is uh, th these lessons uh, are applicable to any to any domain, to be honest. So it's more more important to have uh, such uh, 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 activities like this webinar and have persons like uh, John to explain us and give more insights on the lessons learned rather than trying to move a piece of codes in, in other domains. I don't know how you feel, uh, how uh, you, John, feel about that. Oh, uh, I, I, I agree. I agree completely. I think that's um, um, the, the, the principles and the learnings. We've tried to make those as, as, as open as the, the raw code. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Brian, for asking the question. So there is a question from Mary Angelique Lapot. Um, I will uh, ask the question as she cannot speak. How to write a script without knowing the structure of the data? And a second uh, question, common lists are, were mentioned. We do have ontologies that were developed in agriculture. How, where can they be used in the process? May I answer the first one? Sure. Uh, you cannot build a, a script without knowing the data. So this is why it's important to have uh, uh, to, to, to be able to see either some portions of data, uh, some samples, or some anonymized data, but 
uh, have, uh, but uh, anonymized data that should have the same structure or synthetic data that again have the same structure with the real data. Otherwise, whatever you build, since your script will, will live from you and your control, uh, and, uh, it should be able to run smooth over data that you have never seen. So it's uh, this step, it's the very step that enables everything. You need to have the same structure uh, with the real data, with the real raw data, but uh, as this structure uh, is public, you need to take all the necessary actions so as not uh, for that data that are the public version of your data to have inside uh, information that is or can be considered as uh, uh, PII relevant. Uh, and the second question was about ontologies. I think that this for, uh, falls more on the ability to, to retrieve data uh, or to transform data. I think that a generic answer on how ontologies could be uh, used in this context cannot be uh, given. It depends highly on the use case that you have in mind. So if, if you can just, uh, if you have a use case in your mind. Uh, can I interject with a question following on to Marie-Angelique's? I mean, you know, I'm not a technical person myself, but from what I what I heard of the of the web in the in the in the video um, initially, I mean, what you're you you need standardized, understandable terms that your scripts are going after, presumably, and so that's where those data dictionaries that were popped up briefly come in, and I perhaps that's what Marie-Angelique is getting at. I'm oh. not sure. But, but some level of standardization and interpretation, interpretability, if you will, um, needs to, to be there. And you know, that could be bespoke data dictionaries. I don't know, John, what, what you guys are, you know, if you're drawing on uh, mesh or, or you know, any, any sort of uh, uh, established medical ontologies, or if, if this is a bespoke um, thing developed at Oxford, but it strikes me that in our domain, we probably have some standards we can pull out. Yeah, these are all built on top of existing, uh, <laughs> if I was being pedantic, I would say they're taxonomies rather than ontologies. So um, SNOMED CT, um, CTV3, ICD-10, these are all publicly available lists of um, diseases or clinical observations or drugs that have, have unique identifiers for them. Um, we're starting to look a little bit more at the uh, ontology, which describes richer interrelationships between concepts. But again, all of those relationships are between coded concepts. As you know, there's a concept that has a, a definition and a unique identifier. Without the, the, the data being kind of cleansed and standardized, it's extremely hard to make relate infer uh, kind of relational or ontological inferences between concepts that are not not well defined may I add something extra perhaps the use of ontologies uh, in our domain is not that uh, it's not equivalent to how the relevant uh, taxonomies have been used in uh, uh, in open safely perhaps uh, their role is uh, to make the scripts that you write more reusable in the sense that they, in theory, they enable interoperability between data sets. So if you write a script that operates using some concepts, using some variables, some ICASA variables, for example, and your data have a different structure and different vocabulary, by using ontologies, perhaps it would be easier for you uh, to design a version of your script that can operate in another uh, uh, public, in another private space. The problem that we have, or another additional problem that we have in our domain, is that we lack uh, standards that describe the, the data per se. For example, in the clinical records, they have fire. They have very specific structure of how the a clinical record is uh, is uh, depicted in uh, 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 structure uh, digitally, and also they have common uh, they have common, not only vocabularies, but they have also uh, either common or protocol, either common protocols or protocols that are aligned uh, between uh, practitioners, which are things that in our domain we, we uh, largely lack. 
So perhaps this is the space of ontologies uh, that, that makes sense in this story. Zavu, what's your feeling on that? No, yeah, I, I, I agree. No, nothing, nothing to add, really. No, I think we have another question from Brian. Um, so. um, hi there. Yeah, there's um, a, a sort of inevitably the question always comes, you know, the discussion always comes around to governance when we look at um, uh, information systems of this type with multiple stakeholders and uh, underlying data stores and responsible responsibility to be uh, to be responsible um, with, with that data. And so it's, it's, you know, you can you can gather some things from the Open Safely website, but I was interested in knowing um, a bit more about how governance um, was established of the, the, the effort itself um, and perhaps uh, the intersection between that governance and data governance um, in the Open Safely experience. So I, I joined the project in, in June, so I'm not particularly aware of the initial phase. It's one thing that is um, perhaps not been mentioned so far is that the level of access the, the Open Safely has to patient data is, is unprecedented. And this is due to um, a kind of COPE control of patient information legislation that was put through specifically in response to COVID-19. So um, we, we kind of, the initial path was smoothed by this by this legislation. From the point of view of establishing processes and how that's gone, um, I have to acknowledge the Office of National Statistics, which is UK government body that provides training and certification for for researchers. So we require researchers who can access the um, the outputs layer, so not even the pseudonymized data, let alone the private data, but the analytical results from the pseudonymized layer to have. Um, uh, accredited researcher status, and they also provide training and exams for, for output checking. We certainly found it's been a little bit of friction with some researchers who are used to previous models where they would be either sent the raw data or given access to the raw data. Um, and we've had a little bit of pushback there, but unfortunately, <laughs> Our whole raison d'etre is around patient privacy. You just have to uh, adapt your thinking slightly and uh, coming from a database background, when I was developing some of my analytical scripts, I think, oh gosh, darn it, I really wish I could just have a poke around the raw data. This would be so much easier. Uh, and, and it would be, but that would be unacceptable from a patient safety point of view. So these are the compromises we have to make. Thank you very much, John. So we are right on time, so I will stop here for the questions. A lot of thank you. Thank you to John, Pythagoras, uh, Jao for taking the time to prepare the webinar, for taking the questions. It was really great. I think it raised a lot of uh, attention and interest, and this is a really good starting point for a deeper uh, discussion on the topic.